This video discusses the concept of humanism and its relationship to ideas about periodization and English literature. Before watching this video, please read the assigned selection from the Norton Anthology, which is on Icon. This week we turn from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, and I, for one, am sad. For those of you who, like me, love Chaucer, consider following the Chaucer Twitter feed created by Chaucerian Brantley Bryant. It's super fun, witty, and has some pretty high-profile fans, such as Lin-Manuel Miranda. This video, as I said, centers on the concept of humanism. Here, and for the purposes of the final, I will define humanism as it has been understood in relation to the Renaissance in Europe. First off, please note a tricky aspect of periodization. Periodization refers to the division of different literary, cultural, and social phenomena into distinct time periods. In the case of the Renaissance, it began at different times in Europe. In Italy, the Renaissance began during the 14th century. In other words, while Chaucer lived during the English Middle Ages, he also lived during the Italian Renaissance. Scholars typically claim that the Renaissance began in England over a century later at the end of the 15th century. Okay, let's return to humanism as it was understood during the Renaissance. I will start with the Latin etymology of the word humanism, which is humanitas. This word speaks both to the classical emphasis of the Renaissance and the relationship of humanism to education. The fact that humanitas is a Latin word reflects how Renaissance thinkers and writers were deeply invested in classical learning, that is, in knowing as much as they could about writers and artists who lived in ancient Rome and Greece. Latin originated as the language of ancient Rome. For an ancient Roman writer, like Cicero, the term humanitas referred to the values associated with a liberal arts education, which involved studying language, literature, history, and philosophy. As an English major, you are the inheritor of this idea about a liberal arts education. English is one of several humanities majors. Our use of the contemporary educational term humanities refers back to Renaissance humanism, and before that, classical humanism and its association back then with education. Okay, let's review. The key term humanism during the European Renaissance can be defined in terms of the Latin word humanitas, which refers to the Renaissance stress on classical learning. In addition, and this is super important. The term humanism refers to a particular idea of human identity that circulated during the Renaissance and later. We can refer to this idea of the human as individualism. It concerns the idea that humans during the Renaissance were very aware of themselves and indeed embraced and celebrated themselves as distinct and autonomous individuals or selves. This idea of humanism emphasizes the goodness and value of a human being. It concerns the idea that there is something wonderful inside an individual person that merits nurturing and development. The goals and aims of this brand of humanism are utterly centered on this world, the earth, and what happens here. It concerns achieving the richest, fullest human life on earth, both in terms of one's inner life and one's social connections. In other words, instead of obsessing over the afterlife, the question of whether one would go to heaven or hell, Renaissance humanists were all about achievement on earth. Such notions were premised on ideas of human agency, rationality, and autonomy. That is the idea that humans can do things of their own accord, 
independently and without outside influence. Humanism really emphasizes a person's mental capacity, one's ability to think, one's brain power. Let's review. And if you haven't jotted anything down yet, this is an excellent time to do so. Renaissance humanism understands humans as autonomous individuals who achieve things through their brain power. It celebrates interiority, the unique selfhood within each of us, and it celebrates achievement, what men can do and attain. It concerns making the most of life on earth and realizing one's personal desires and goals. Renaissance humanism was very anthropocentric. That is, it placed man at the center of everything. It claimed that man is the proper master of the world. And it posited that the world, indeed the entire universe, exists for the pleasure of man. For example, following the Greek thinker Protagoras, Italian Renaissance thinker Leon Battista Alberti proclaimed that man is the mean and measure of all things. Such a statement indicates that man in and of himself, not some extrinsic entity like God, is the ultimate source of value. The very idea of measuring the world in terms of feet, that is human feet, reflects this idea that the meaning of the world is utterly bound up in human identity. In addition, Renaissance humanists believed that among humans, only men were possessed of full humanity. Yes, binary thinking was more than alive and well during this time. Like medieval authorities, Renaissance thinkers aligned men with the mind and women with the body and used that dualism to authorize giving power and agency to men. I have a quote here from the Norton Introduction to the 16th century that acknowledges this misogynistic attitude. There are certain phenomena that speak to a new stress on the self during the Renaissance. For example, consider changes in the visual arts. While during the Middle Ages, the people on which a painting would focus tended to be the Holy Family. We see a proliferation during the Renaissance of portraits of individual men and far less frequently women. Here's a portrait of the woman who, during the English Renaissance, radically challenged misogynistic ideas of female passivity and objecthood, Queen Elizabeth I. And here is Hans Holbein the Younger's portrait of Sir Thomas More, an important English Renaissance humanist who, among other things, was King Henry VIII's chancellor until the king executed More for treason because More refused to put the king before the Catholic Church. Sounds a little bit like Thomas Becket. Look carefully at this marvelous portrait Try close reading it in the same way that you would close read a literary text. Consider all of its components, its colors, its form, its organization, its content, and so on. No detail is too small. How does this portrait exemplify a Renaissance humanist conception of the human? Try pausing the video and jotting down some ideas of your own. There are so many aspects of this image to discuss, but let me stress here the depiction of Moore's eyes. We all know that chestnut about the eyes being the windows of the soul. I think a version of that is happening here. Moore's eyes are rendered beautifully and they look especially alert, knowing, and perceptive. They bring our attention to Moore's selfhood, to his interiority. They tell us, that is, that something, actually quite a lot it seems, is going on inside Moore's head. His eyes alert us 
to his mental capacity, his brain power, and his unique point of view. Here's one more painting for you to consider and possibly discuss in section. This is another masterpiece by Holbein. It's called The Ambassadors. What do you make of the fact that this is a portrait of not one, but two men? What do you make of the other details here? And what do you make of the odd image in the foreground? If you stood in front of the painting and moved to the side of it, you would be able to make it out. It's a skull. That painterly technique is called anamorphosis.